Hi, friends. Welcome. I hope you're feeling well and you're secure. Uh, we're going to continue with the differences of the Lotus sect versus of the other sects in Nitrin's day. Um, as the foundation, the writing, the treatise, if you will, for uh, the discussion of the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment. Uh, basically, as we've already discussed, the teaching that um, the universe is a great engine of manifestation. And the manifestations are just happening throughout the universe as a matter of course. They influence one another. They, uh, just like chemical reactions and temperatures, tendencies and conditions, Water will be a liquid at certain temperatures as it is uh, its tendency, uh, its tendencies of energetic manifestations uh, under different pressures, different temperatures. It's it could be a gas, it can be a vapor, it can be a solid, right? <clears throat> it's just the way the universe works. We uh, sentient beings are an amalgam of so many unfathomable numbers of energies manifesting in their own particular ways, karma, uh, energy with work, action, tendencies and conditions, form or go through formations toward forming this apparatus that includes not only ourselves, but because by the process itself, we're just like anything else in the universe, a formation, but our formation, our specific complexity allows us to emerge a mind, a mind to do what? A mind that, that is what exactly is its purpose, its doing, its being, because it too is manifested of this process and what buddhism says is that it exists to observe the process to be conscious of the process and there are different levels of consciousness because in order to observe a process one has to first conceive of the process and evidence of the process which is in this apparatus, visual, oral, uh, uh, textural, uh, odor, smell, all of these basic consciousnesses need to be in place in order to evaluate and be able to determine or have an opinion or have a consciousness of the process writ large, right? And the consciousness of this entire process writ large is Buddha. That's what we're doing. Conscious or not paying attention to is the difference between ignorance and enlightenment. Once you pay attention then all of the little baubles of the lower consciousnesses that preoccupy us all day long, like unenlightened or, or um, like uh, unmatured, like children, 
that are fascinated with all the shiny things and the, the bunches of things and the squishy things, and, right, on and on. Once you mature to this overall concept of everything, then all of that's still there, but it doesn't completely own you. And how does it own you? By you pretending, IDing yourself, your very identity with owning it. This, this push-pull of owning owned is where all our suffering comes from. Aha! Mature your mind, view the entire process, and release yourself from that immature battle, and you become enlightened. Namo myoho renge kyo. So, once he's identified it, uh, Nietzsche continues, this fact that Grandmaster Tendai, Chi Yi, did not mention even the name of the 3,000 existences contained in one thought moment, doctrine in his various works tells us that it was the most treasured and ultimate doctrine to him. It was his basis of reasoning. Therefore, it is understandable that Chang'an, his successor, who recorded the great concentration and insight as Tendai preached it, stated in his preface that the teaching of Moho Chikwan was nothing but the Grand Master Tendai's practiced deep in his mind. Those who wish to read and understand the great concentration and insight should never think that there were any other secret doctrines of Grandmaster Tendai. Secret. There's that word again, secret. Um, greatly realized thoughts. The great concentration and insight itself Fasso 5 also reads, quote, The ten modes of contemplation are a subtle and exquisite synthesis of wisdoms and virtues put together both horizontally and vertically. At the beginning, those who practice can correctly judge the spot, which is the object of contemplation. In the midway, the main and auxiliary practices can work together well, and in the end, those who practice can get rid of all attachments completely. This is what I started out today's video talking about. When you properly understand the order of things, the process of things, then the, the attachments become unreasonable. They, they become obviously distractions from the great picture altogether. They're, they put in their proper place. You know, the vertically, horizontally, this is the, the order of teaching, the, the, or the magnitude and the experience of teachings. You could break that down in many different ways. The result is the same. When one takes away, continuing, uh, what one takes away of these, when one takes the way of these 10 modes of contemplation, his intent is refined and his method of contemplation skillfully equipped with all sorts of wisdom, virtue, and practice. Again, restating that, which I was saying earlier, the maturity. Beginners in practice can follow his example to proceed into the stage of shoju, or the first stage. Such monks who practice Zen meditation only without any knowledge of doctrines or those who busy themselves with doctrines without practicing meditation cannot know this at all. <clears throat> so again, another specific slight toward the Zen practitioners who've gone off on their own little branch. And What the Buddha sought by piling up his merit for a long time, what he attained at the Hall of Enlightenment, what the Buddha expounded in the second chapter of the Lotus Sutra, Expedience, 
after three earnest requests of Shariputra, and what he preached in three circles, direct, simile, and cause and effect preachings, are all aimed at having all living beings gain the same insight as the Buddha through practicing these ten modes of contemplation. So what are these ten modes? These ten modes. Keeps talking about these ten modes, right? The annotation on the great concentration and insight by Hung Chi, or no, that is the Chinese title of the annotations. Fasal 5 explains this. The Buddha's preachings in his lifetime are classified as 16 gates in four teachings or eight teachings in five periods. All these are clarified, bundled together, and stored in the one vehicle of the Lotus Sutra. And various sutras are preserved in the truth of the Lotus Sutra. Therefore, the intent of the ten modes of contemplation cannot be grasped even by the lords of sutras preached before the Lotus Sutra, much less those of Zen masters who practice only the meditation without knowing anything about Buddhism. In other words, without context, without understanding the methodologies described by Shakyamuni, simply sitting and looking into one's own mind will not result in enlightenment. In fact, it's a kind of egoistic practice, isn't it? It's very self-justifying. It's cut off from the understanding of Buddha. The part in the Moha Chikwan following the phrase, quote, what the Buddha pursued by practicing and training for a long time, end quote, praises the tranquility and meditation of the ten modes of contemplation. Since the ten modes of contemplation are the way of attaining enlightenment in the Lotus Sutra, it was praised with the words of the Lotus Sutra. What the Buddha sought for a long time means, according to the theoretical section, the duration of time since the days of Daitsu Shisho, the great universal wisdom Buddha, what he gained at the Hall of Enlightenment means attaining enlightenment under the Pipal tree at Buddha Gaya. According to the essential section of the Lotus Sutra, it has been innumerable kalpa since he practiced the way of bodhisattvas and his attainment of Buddhahood 500 dust particle kalpas ago. Right, which is an inconceivably remote past, is called the Enlightenment at the Hall of Practice. Both the essential and theoretical teachings preach the seeking of the ten modes of contemplation and the enlightenment gained through them. What Shariputra begged the Buddha three times to expound refers to what the Buddha intended to preach at the Hall of Enlightenment in Gaya after attaining enlightenment. Since the people's ability to understand was not ripe, the Buddha was afraid that they would both not believe him and also rebel against him and thus fall into hell because it was just too much for them to grasp, right? The Buddha, therefore, for more than 40 years, preached expedient teachings to nurture gradually the ability of the people to understand until at the assembly of the Lotus Sutra, he, for the first time, showed the true teaching that replaced the expedient teachings. Right? We've read and I've talked about this succession of teachings, the way Shakyamuni taught ad nauseum, right? You've heard this before. The people who had long listened to the provisional teachings then wondered with doubt and cordially requested the Buddha three times to expound the most important teaching. Even though they were highly prepared and had studied for 40 years, they were like, what? Really? At that moment, those 5,000 self-conceited monks left the assembly. Remember who those are? Shakyamuni was, it's in the Lotus Sutra. You read it. Shakyamuni says, now I will give you the truth. Now be prepared this is the shit. And 5,000 people, arhats, Hinayana experts, who thought, right, the words of the lotus, who thought they had achieved what they had not, 
Oh, we know all about Buddhahood. You can't tell us anything new. We've heard all this before. See you later. I'm out. They take off. And Shakyamuni remains quiet while they do all their and leave. And when they're gone, he puts them down hard. Right? Remember? Now that the trash is gone, right? So much for Buddha tolerance. He tolerated them all right till they were gone. And then he said to the rest of his students, because in his way, he's admiring them for having the humility to understand they don't know yet. So whatever he actually said, basically he was telling those who remained, now we can resume with your enlightenment. Where was I? And left the assembly, leaving behind those who were pure and mature. There you go. Those who remained were all induced into the one Buddha teaching, without discrimination in teachings, practices, and persons, and principle. Namo myoho renge kyo. That's how you do it. Those people who left, they think they've already gotten there. Let them go. Maybe they'll come back. Maybe they won't. It's on them. You're here, so let me tell you how to enlighten yourself. Fully. Vertically, horizontally, and whatever. Namo myoho renge kyo. Now Nietzsche continues. Now this is, that was a quote from the annotations on the great concentration and insight. Not from just somebody. This is the lineage of Buddhist teachings. So this is no idle statement. Right? This shows the order of preaching adopted by five Buddhas. Provisional teachings first, followed by true teachings. The way of preaching the principle of Dharma directly for people with greater capa uh, capability is the preaching by Dharma circle and preaching with similes for people with mediocre abilities is called the preaching by simile circle while preaching with cause and effect stories for those of the low caliber is the preaching of cause and effect circle. The Buddha definitely intends to cause all living beings to awaken themselves through the ten modes of contemplation. Grandmaster Tendai, therefore, after showing the meditation methods, likens them to the great white bullock cart in the simile of the three carts in the burning house. Right? That, that um, fable story, analogy story in uh, the third chapter? I forget which chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Contemplating this, we may say that uh, uh, what Grandmaster Tendai wanted to state in his great concentration and insight was to establish the perfect and sudden practice based on the intent of the Lotus Sutra to reveal the truth, replacing the expedient, in order for us all to attain Buddha wisdom preached in the Lotus Sutra. So what is the perfect and sudden? Namo myoho renge kyo. It's immediate. Hmm? However, those who were bewildered went astray in other Buddhist teachings. Chen Quan of the Flower Garland sect, for instance, misunderstood that the Flower Garland Sutra was perfect and sudden in teachings without realizing that the Sutra preaches the perfect and one vehicle teaching mixed with distinct provisional and expedient teachings. He lost sight of the intention of the Lotus Sutra revealing the true teaching to replace the expedient and looked down upon the profound and wonderful teaching expounded only in the Lotus Sutra. If we understand both the essential and theoretical teachings correctly, the thoroughly examining the teachings of Buddha preached in the five periods of a lifetime, there will be no doubt that the most perfect and sudden teaching is none other than the Lotus Sutra. This is Nietzsche talking, just to remind you. Grandmaster Tendai therefore states in conclusion, quote, 
the teaching which the Buddha had long practiced, so on and so forth, and preached in the three circles is nothing but the ten modes of contemplation, end quote, on the perfect and sudden teaching of the Lotus Sutra. I just want to check real quick. La, 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 la. Yeah, it's not in the, uh, it's not in the back of the book. Ten aspects. Ten FEMA, ten nine. Yep. Okay. I'm going to do a little digging on that because I want to be sure what he's meant, what Nietzsche meant by the ten modes, uh, let alone what ten die meant. Obviously, it's, it's the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, but... I'm curious what the ten refers to. Can't be the ten aspects. Meditation on each aspect, perhaps. Quoting a passage from the Flower Garland Sutra in the beginning is to re reintroduce the appearance of the world, Kyo, on which to contemplate. So some people say that the character Kyo refers to teaching. But you can see right here in Nietzsche's own words, appearance of the world, kyo. So kyo is, is not just a teaching. This is often a mistranslation of the word dharma. Because dharma isn't simply a teaching. It's an awakening. It's a, it's a totality of experience. The, the engine of the universe itself in, perceived in our mind. That's kill. Right? Again, it's not, it's not a, 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 a word. It's a concept. It's huge. Namo myoho renge kill the entirety of understanding. You see? On which to contemplate. As for the statement in the Flower Garland Sutra, which says that, quote, the mind produces everything, end quote, it is exactly what is meant by, quote, mind is equipped with everything, end quote, in the great concentration and insight. See, this is a quote from the Flower Garland, the first words out of Shakyamuni's mouth after he attained enlightenment which after a couple of weeks he backed off of because everyone was looking at him like he was from another planet. But here it is almost word for word quoted by Chi Yi Tendai in his Great Concentration and Insight. See the consistency from beginning to end? The answer is there. The capacity to understand it is what has changed. Therefore, the mind produces, quote unquote, passage is cited from the Flower Garden Sutra to prove that, quote, the mind is equipped with, end quote, passage, um, oops, equipped with passage means. In the Flower Garden Sutra, Fasal 18, Bodhisattva Kung Te Lin utters in verse, quote, just as a skillful painter draws every phenomena freely, a mind can produce every kind of phenomena and existence in the world, since the mind, the Buddha, and living beings are united in one without discrimination. One who wants to know all Buddhas in the past, present, and future lives should contemplate that one's mind produces every Buddha. Unless one understands the meaning of 3,000 existences or realms contained in one thought, as stated in the Great Concentration and Insight, how can one comprehend what is meant by the scriptural statement that there are, is no discrimination among the three minds, Buddha and living beings? Sincerely, 
in considering the superiority between the Tendai Lotus sect and various other sects, it is recommended that you investigate them with such as this 3,000 existences contained in one thought moment doctrine discussed herein. On the 18th day of the second month, Nichiren. So, this is certainly to Nichiren, but obviated by many documents such as this, the lineage of scholarship going all the way back to Shakyamuni, the very definition of Buddha is in his last statement exists only within the mind. Now here's the thing. I just watched a video this morning um, about how we humans distinguish ourselves uh, as superior or, uh, or non-superior to our things, accomplishments, our being, right? Uh, I'm, a, I'm not only, uh, I'm not only a, a, a programmer or I'm not only a sales clerk or I'm not only a this or that, but I'm uh, better than most. Right? And in other instances, oh, uh, I, I don't know. I just do what I do. I don't know if I'm better or worse or blah, 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 blah. And it's interesting because psychologically, humans tend to way overestimate their capacities, their abilities, um, who are humans who are less and less able to do certain things overestimate their ability more and more relative to one another. And those who are, in fact, expert tend to diminish themselves in the scope of... So on the surface, you go, well, that's really messed up. But when you dig a little deeper, you find that the person who's barely capable let's say, overestimates their capacity wildly in large part because of their inability to determine or to judge empirically if they're successful or not. They're simply unaware of how to do the task well and so the two or three markers out of a hundred that they seem to perform to their own satisfaction would indicate that they're very capable. But once they take a class or go through some kind of a learning program to understand how to do that task well, they suddenly become aware of many levels of accomplishment in order to make the task well that they then back off of their superiority and can look back on their own efforts as, oh my gosh, I really missed so much. I had no idea, right? That kind of thinking. And the on the other end of the spectrum, something that I discovered on my own, I used to say that talent was the one thing that we least respect in our abilities. Uh, and I've had a lot of turned heads about that. And my explanation was always one, when you're really talented at something, you do it with very little effort. It just, it, you just express it. And so therefore you can't imagine that that's a hard thing to do. So you don't boast it. You don't boast about it. Well, this is what this study found is that people who truly were capable of things knew so much about the idea that when you can do something, um, you are always unaware of every aspect of how to do it. You do it with facility. Therefore, there must not be that aspect. But here's something you've heard many times. Um, 
I know enough about how to do something that I know what I don't know how to do. So the expert tends to focus on what's missing and therefore doesn't claim to boast about what he or she is doing because they're very much aware that there's always stuff to learn. And on the other end of the spectrum, because they're unaware of how much stuff there is to learn, they assume that what they do know is the pinnacle. Why do I bring this up? Because <laughs> it's, it's very much like Buddhism. When Buddhism talks about the ignorant, they're not saying stupid people. They're saying people that are simply unaware of what it is they have to get into place, they have to understand in order to get the bigger picture. Like the Arhats. They think they've gotten it, the whole picture, but they're not humble enough to, to sit back and maybe learn that there's something they haven't learned yet, which would then enable them to truly excel. But they're arrogant, right? That's what they're called arrogant because they assume to know what they don't this is just human behavior buddhism is about the mind attitude and intent so if you understand that the three thousand realms in a single thought moment is simply a bunch of words trying to communicate that in every single thought moment we have in the day birth that birth that birth that birth that birth that moment 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 the entire universe is moving momentum we are moving everything is moving through time manifesting in each moment it from its maximal potential what can be and that process is being so first step become aware of the largesse of that and that you are part and parcel of that process next step observe how it's going the magnificence of it obviously but also what areas of your life, your thinking, your thought moment, your expression, your manifestation is holding you back? Focus always on the totality and the understanding and those lacking areas will start to get filled in, influenced, grow, move toward the full expression without hindrance of this process, this life process of the universe. In doing so, we naturally lose these false attachments and investments that they become meaningless. So it's not like we have to go through hacking bad habits those bad habits, they just, at some point, you stop sucking your thumb because it just wasn't any payoff. It was ridiculous to keep that going, right? As your body developed, you stopped peeing yourself. It wasn't just because you got potty trained. That was some way to release those things in an access socially acceptable manner. But the point is you gain control over it. Whereas you did not before. And you could then choose what to do. Right? Thanks for, thanks for listening, watching, downloading. Thank you for your purchases on the bookstore, the mandala store, your donations on Patreon. 
through PayPal, your likes, mostly your subscribe. Your subscribing is very valuable to this algorithm on Lotus Sutra so that we can get this teaching into the hands of more people, the ears and eyes of more people. But ultimately, mostly, thank you for your practice. And in that vein, keep your practice strong. Take care of your health so you can continue to practice and gain stronger health. Right? Your support is, you know, invaluable. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.